Well, I have a couple questions. All righty. So just kind of starting at the beginning of what we do on the job site, right? So the embed process for us, like right now, are we, like, do we have a good solid process for the embeds of Mac clips? Like, are all like the families, you know, built with all their, their information in them and the, and the points are in them for the total station and the, like, if we, is that process pretty solid for us right now? Or is there work to do in that part of the drawing process? Well, I believe the, the total station points, I, I think those are built in, correct, Mike? I know you're working on total station. Jobo, you can correct me if I'm wrong as well, since you just did something like that. Yeah, this was my first experience with the new process, and um, I actually was not sure how everything went, but uh, it seemed pretty good. It was, the, the, yeah, they're put into Revit, and then you just do a, an output. Um, there's a command to the output, and it creates a text file. And it's um, and you're using the the what's the software from Autodesk to do that, right? To to get the points out of Revit, right? Uh, let me share my screen. So you got my screen here? Yes. Okay. So I have my total station floor plans here. So it's got this little object that Alan creates with his tool mm -hmm. um, with the properties on it. And then I just go over here and do this, export coordinates, put the folder and it will run it that way. So it's using Alan's stuff. I don't know if it's using the Autodesk stuff directly, but um, yeah, that's how it works. Interesting. And those points, sorry, you can, you can share your screen again, Mike. So when it numbers the points, it seems mm -hmm. like it's really in um, no particular order. Is that correct? It's just no. It it will select. Um, so I picked like four thousand one for the first one, and then it will number them in consecutive order after that. So seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So that they are following in order. There. And this oh, is, they are. Okay. There's four thousands because this is the fourth floor. Right. I was actually going off of a Jobo's um, numbering scheme for that. That was how he was doing it. It seemed good to me. That's interesting. I, I, we had bought a piece of software. I should be careful because I think we renew it every year to do the point layout. It was called, I think it was Autodesk Point Layout. Um, okay. So I'm kind of curious. I guess Gabe would probably know when he gets back why we... Maybe it wasn't quite as easy as when you did the, this looks a lot like the program I wrote. So that's what I was wondering. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it was, I mean, it did, as far as I could tell, what it needed it to. Um, if, if you can differentiate the offsets here, it puts the point numbers in. Um, so yeah, it was seemed to work well. Yeah, nice. Well, it's a much, much better interface. And Obviously, because Alan did it much better, much, much better written than the one I did. So looks good. Okay, cool. Yeah, I just I wasn't sure. You know, I, I was out at Matilda and we were doing the embed installs, and then we were doing the Mac clip installs, and it just made me think about you know how you know whether that part of the process how you know because we don't talk about embed drawings very often, at least I don't. So. Cool. So how do how do those points? So it's not really tied in with the mullion, right? Like how do um, they? Like... Yes, it is. So this is an object, and there's the placement point that I give it, and then it puts the point six inches back and two feet back, or wherever I tell it. If I revise that to three foot, it moves the point back. And that's tied in with the uh, the embed or the mat clip or the mullion. That's, this is tied in with wherever I place it. And I placed it at back and This is a slope pool, so it's kind of hard to see. But in this case over here, well, okay, that one I put at the back of a, a tube. But it's wherever I pick the point. Oh, okay. So it's not really tied into any particular element. It's just where you physically no, pick. But if I had wanted to, I could have done this. So what I did, which Jobo recommended, which is I think the best way to do it for mine, is just use this place to command, which placed the two points back there. 
and I did that based on whatever mullion I selected. I only needed a few mullions. TJ just needed the slope walls here. He didn't care about all these because he can work out the 90 degree walls based on the dimensions of the shop drawings. Um, so I just did this and did individual mullions. If I had done this place coordinates one, then it would have done it based on the walls, which is I think more what you were talking about. Um, but yeah, I, I mine were a little more yeah, yeah. weird because they were the slope walls. So that was why I used the, the specific one right there. Gotcha. Nice. Yeah, this was all new to me as of this week. I have learned it over the past few days. Right on. And then Steve, did you have embed or Mac clip questions? Is it? No, just, I just wanted to, I made me think about, you know, how we do that layout and what we were using to do it. Cause again, like, you know, when we first started, it was like, oh, cool. This, here's a piece of software from Autodesk that does that for you, you know, and Gabe's like, oh, cool. But I didn't know where we ended up cause I didn't get involved. So, but I don't have to keep an eye out cause I think we renew that thing you know, every year. So I just want to make sure I'm not paying for it if we're not using it. Yeah. yeah. I'll make a note for myself to ask Gabe when he comes back. That's great. If the, uh, if the embed libraries and the MacBook libraries are all, you need that's what you need. That's, that's great. Good progress. Right. Anyone else have any questions? Well, I see now we have a, a large crowd, probably because you guys were all very curious at what we were going to be discussing today. So, um, <laughs> um, but as some of you already know that, um, you know, I didn't really have a great topic planned out for today. So we kind of opened the floor for anyone. If you have any questions or something that we kind of review, um, that would be beneficial to the rest of the group kind of like what they do in the takeoff group with the uh, the stump the checker training sessions. I have a question. All right. Um, so I know there's been talk about uh, instead of doing Quasar, um, just built off of whatever wireframe models we make to do it off of the sales model. Or excuse me, go back. Using the sales model directly instead of using Quasar at all. Um, is that yeah, nearing completion, or is that still always out? Just kind of curious to know what does that. Yeah, well, um, I don't know, Steve, I know you probably know more about it than I do. If you want to take this one, or I can try my best at taking it. Yeah, because um, it's part of the goals of what we're working on. Um, we're going to be, so we had two different modeling methods. We had what Amy brought to the table, what we call the Amy units, right? And then we have our normal curtain wall modeling that we do in operations. Um, the AMI units are really not using the curtain wall tool in Revit, they're using curtain panels. Um, and then they have things nested into those curtain panels. And while they're, you know, the way that that modeling process works is quick um, and, and gets you a good sales model fairly quickly and gets us our pricing, which is what we were looking for from the sales model they weren't very uh, amenable to what we're trying to do in operations, which is really drive all the way through the FAB tickets. Um, so Gabriel had an idea on how he could sort of do something kind of in the middle, which was sort of use a curtain panel, but make it more flexible where you could change out the parts easily on the curtain panel, so like we do in the curtain walls, right? So. That's the experiment that he's going through. And I think, you know, he's, I think next week going to have a proof of concept ready to show everybody. So we can kind of walk through that with the drafting group and the takeoff group and kind of show everybody what this would look like. Um, but yeah, what it would mean is that we don't really have to convert the sales model because we would be changing in operations from building in curtain walls to building in curtain panels. Um, the model's a lot more lightweight. Um, it definitely, uh, it, it's a little easier to work with, I think, because, you know, instead of having an outer frame and an inner frame and a bunch of pieces of glass, you just have a unit <laughs> and all the stuff's in it. You know what I mean? Um, so it's very containerized. Um, but, but the way that Gabe has it, it's really nice, pretty flexible. You know, you make one change, you can update your building. 
Um, so I think you'll really like what he's come up with. It's kind of in the middle. It's like, you know, a little, little more work than an Amy unit for the sales group, and then very little work to sort of turn it into what we want when we get into operations. So, yeah, so that's kind of where we're headed. This is what we're experimenting with. Um, but most of the heavy lifting is kind of done. He's kind of, I just wanted him to build out a little sample so everybody could kind of see it, talk about it, look at it, and kind of see what that would, what would that feel like in operations, you know? Cool. Yeah, no, what, what we, what we already have is great. Um, better is always good. So yeah. are, we, are we trying to matter on the new project currently, Jessica's job and my job? No. No, yeah. It would probably start in sales. So, you know, and since we haven't adopted it yet or even got it all working, um, we've got some work to do. Um, it would require some reworking of Amber's process a little bit too, because she's not really building a profile to be extruded along a curtain wall, you know, uh, grid. She's building a generic model to be nested inside a curtain panel. So we have to change that process slightly um, Alan's stool for putting glass in needs to be updated to handle this type of thing. But the glass would be a lot simpler um, and the glass bites are contained right in the mullions. They're not a separate thing outside of the, the process, um, which will make it a lot simpler for both the drafting group and the takeoff group to adjust things if they need to. Um, yeah, so, it, but it hasn't, nothing's in place at all. It's it's really, we want to do a little proof of concept, get everybody to look at it, make sure everybody understands and gets their input. And then we would start looking at, you know, finishing the idea and then start using it in sales. And then you would see it at some future date in operations. But yeah, nothing yet, for sure. All right. Good question, Mike. Anyone else have any uh, questions? I have a question. All right. Um, so, and when we're doing the embed drawings, like I know now if we have a embed that needs to connect to a post, um, we will name it FE109A because that's the indication that they need to order angles with it. But if you have like kind of a couple complicated details and in some locations they might need like three angles another location, one angle, should there be more embed types than FE109A or is that just something up to the PM to figure out? Yeah, so we're not actually creating multiple. Um, so let's see, you're talking like condition where you have a column, right? Yeah. So like the 109As and the 110A, it's only gonna just, like put up a flag for Heather, for her to look out for additional angles that are required. So really the 109A is still an embed 109. It's just now the 109A is just gonna indicate that we're gonna need some additional steel to attach this to back to the building. Okay, and so like in this detail, one of those embeds needs, looks like a really long angle and one of those embeds needs two shorter angles, but they would still just have the same name of like FE109A. Yes, and I, I, I believe, and someone else, Steve, you can probably correct me if I'm wrong. Um, the, the angle itself, it looks like they're all the same, you know, two by three. So I don't know if the field's just gonna receive just you know, certain lengths of these, and then they can cut the angles out there to fit for their need. I don't, I'm not sure how that's gonna, or do we need to fabricate those, like create fab drawings for them? Yeah, I would say, you know, the, the biggest thing right now is that the stuff's getting missed altogether, right? So the A was the little stop gap and Heather will ensure that we have what we need or whatever the field wants. I'm sure different field guys want different things. Some guys probably like to chop them up themselves, but they're pretty hard to chop. So, you know, that's that's a that's a tough cut right there with the, uh, the grinder saw, right? If you've seen cut steel. Um, so I, I think, you know, we'll just <clears throat> take those off and order them, you know, separately outside of the process. You know, I think as we, 
you know, it took me, I don't know, what was a year and a half, James, to answer your question about these collisions. <laughs> it wasn't that long. It was, uh, it I think, early this year. Yeah. Yeah. At, least 30, uh, at least 30 questions went by in the Standards League before I could answer it. But um, so I, I'm, what I'd like to do, you know, at some point in the future would be to get more specific because I think that's what everybody's thinking. But I think the first thing is let's let's at least you know we just finally got the details and the and the the information of what do we do when the column's too close to the embed you know when are we needing an angle like can we cut the tails can we weld them like all this stuff right so I think we just got that answer so we'll probably need to sort of wait a minute and kind of see how this shakes out a little and then we can kind of you know maybe take a look at this as a group and decide, okay, yeah, there's, there's only 12 conditions. Let's have an A, B, C, D, E, F, G, whatever, right? Um, or, you know, it's easy enough to just look at the details you've given me. I, I think we're good or, you know, but, but yeah, I agree. But, but it was just a simple way to know that we're not going to miss it because I got one person, Heather, that will make sure it doesn't slip through. And then, um, but then, I, yeah, we'll probably want to get together and decide, do we want to get more specific or on the job site? Is it just too, you know, random? And we, and we kind of need to just give them a bunch of little angles and they can just figure it out or whatever, right? So. Good question, though. Yeah, very good question. I like these questions. Keep them rolling. We haven't stumped him yet, though. We got to stump him. I'm sure someone's got a good one out there. Um, hello, hello. Am I unmuted? Hello, hello. Uh, since I'm currently working on panels, uh, I remember Zach when we first introduced the new uh, panel method of just putting everything into a family. He said that uh, they the panel team doesn't like having multiple generic models in one family because it messes with their count or something. Did we ever get a definitive answer of how we're moving forward with that? Hmm. Did you stump him? <laughs> well, I, as far as I know, I mean, yeah, they don't like having that, but um, I don't know. So on Matilda, we had some kind of complicated panels and I don't know what the alternate would be to modeling those um, because we had like a flat soffit that then became a sloped soffit with a fascia. So I think when we built that, um, Juan had kind of put, you know, in, in one bay, there were like three panels. You had the, the flat soffit one, the sloped one, and then the fascia. And so when he built it out, you know, he, he created like a one curtain wall and then each bay was its own panel, but each panel consisted of like the three panels, right? That's mm -hmm. kind of what you're... Yeah. So how would we break that up in three panels? Um, that you probably stumped me unless I can defer it to an actual expert Revit modeler. Um, um, Catan has a method that doesn't work in all cases, but works in some cases where you he uses a sloped... Uh, wall to model in the like underside basically as a flat panel. Um, and then I've done another method where I basically made a bunch of different families, um, but they all started from the same insertion point and then modeled what they were hosted on all from that same outside face so then they would all come in as like separate models but um, I didn't have to do thinking of moving like walls hosting them around but it was kind of a hassle and really if 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 uh, um, Zach could work out a way that we could just have it all in one model it's probably going to be the easiest for us in terms of modeling it. I think what has happened to the takeoff team is that um, it just causes all their panel tags to be overlapping each other and then they have to manually move it, but we'd probably have to check with Zach. Yeah, so we've been talking about this quite a bit. Zach's working on the updates for the panel team right now that we went through after we did Matilda. And 
my understanding and talking to Zach, his understanding was that we were not modeling the panels, multiple panels in one file, that they were all individual um, because the mark numbers are almost impossible to get right and in the right locations. So the guy in the field, when he's looking at the key sheet, you know, you're gonna have a very difficult time knowing which panel's which. Um, so, so we were, my understanding was from Zach that we had already decided not to model in that way and that Catan had changed all of the panels on Ardenwood to be individualized. Um, but we should, you know, the next job we're doing where we feel like we need a different method, we should talk about it, right? And look at it together. So what I'd like to do is just, if you do run into that situation, let's stop and go over it with everybody and see because I mean, if, it, if it's something we can't get around in Revit, you know, we might have to try to work around with Zach, but you know, he's, he's understanding these panels via geometry, which makes it super tricky to figure out which one's which. Um, so it would, if the simplest solution is that we're not, you know, doing each panel or doing three panels in one file, but that's, and that's what he told me he thought we had all decided, but I was going to check with James on that this week because that's the one part of the panel updates that I had on my list. Zach's doing the rest. <clears throat> okay. Katana, yeah, Katana had originally done like those upper units as one, you know, all in one file, three panels like in one file. And then he ended up going in and, and separating them out, you know. That's a lot of work, especially at the corners. Yeah, he, yeah he, I think he didn't really find it too difficult. That's the so we should probably have Katan give us a little uh, update on what he did because he he had modeled it the other way and he changed it all, and he said it wasn't that bad. So. Oh. Yeah, I'd like to see how he modeled that one. Maybe yeah, I, I think for Matilda. And then the other thing he did was, you know, we had had some of the panels were nested and, you know, Amy had said they needed to be nested, but he had redone the families, at least for the garage, he redid the families and found that he didn't have to have them nested at all. He could, he could make them all work without nesting them. So that's the other thing we were working on was just making sure they're, you know, for the panel team, it's super hard to select them if they're all nested like that, right? So, I don't think they need to be, so we're seeing if we can like switch up the, the templates. <clears throat> yeah, and I think we, we just tried it on Matilda because of the how you know unique the eyebrow shape was. Mm -hmm. So um, when I was um, you know working with Jared, um, he of course encountered some problems when we ran the program or sex program. Um, also on the ones uh, at the portal, which had the child families. So, um, yeah, I think Matilda was just, you know, trying different <laughs> methods to try to accomplish it. But, yeah, moving forward, I guess we, we're we probably going to go with the Katam method. So we'll have... Um... You know, we should have a little opportunity here to, to kind of nail this down and then do some training on it. So kind of walk through what the process looks like and get everybody comfortable with, you know, how you would do it. So, but we could have Katan maybe walk us through what he did. That'd be great. Yeah, because I kind of need, uh, we kind of need the sales group to know this too, right? Because that's where it's going to start because these panels are starting in the sales model and you guys would inherit this already model process, right? Yeah. Dang, sales group sounds kind of front-loaded now. <laughs> just, <laughs> they're just modeling everything. Well, it's, you know, our goal is to sort of, you know, put more and more people in the front and then, you know, have 
mo more of the work happened there, right? Yeah, that makes sense. Hopefully, you know, help our customers, maybe even provide them more options and, and give them things they're not getting now, you know. Nice. Thanks for the question, Jobo. Yeah, thanks for asking that because I needed to find out from James anyway. So they're all here. So sounds like we weren't clear. Um, but if we can, we want to. So if you run into one you don't think you can do, please let us know so we can kind of walk through it together and see if there's a problem. Okay. Yeah, and and on the on panel too, um, for the adaptive ones when we're creating the columns. I believe we there were some updates. I think it was 1180 main, where I could not recreate one of the adaptive um, panels because it had like a unique degree on one of the columns or several. Um, so I think Celine worked it out in a way that you know she was able to accomplish the update, but I could not recreate it. And I'm used to or you know have a little bit more experience doing the panels already, but. I could not um, recreate it, so she had to create a generic model, I believe, to complete the task. Yeah, and that one was um, like the interior, like at a, um, a corner mullion, right? It's the outside corner. At the it's outside a, corner. It's a non 90 degree corner, outside corner, a brace shape that wraps up the corner. Right. And, yeah, it's not able to um, make any changes because the adaptive panel, it was uh, damaged when we tried to uh, re revise it. So rather to spend so much time, we just recreate a generic model and then um, just painted the finish with the takeoff data. Jessica has helped me to walk through how to do it. And yeah, I just have a concern about if we have a lot of adaptive panel had to revise later on. Do we have to do this manually each time? It, it will be a little bit disastrous. Well, I guess my question would be, because a while ago, I, I know Sherwin's group, they weren't really taking those uh, mullion panels as part of their scope, but maybe I'm incorrect. So I guess maybe someone else could answer this question since I'm stumped. <laughs> do we the model yeah, they, panels? So they scare back for Matilda and they, they just learned a lesson from Matilda for not using the model fully because it will make them to almost redo all of their work. So right now they just use mainly the shock drawings and then redo their, uh, redo, redo their work. And so they not fully trust the model right now. So they're not really relying on the model, like what they're planning to do before. So, so it's not really a critical point at, at this project uh, because, yeah, they, they kind of stepping back, not using the model fully at this job. Well, they're, they're, they're done with this job, right? So, and the garage, they weren't, it wasn't part of the plan, but, but they will be, you know, just so we're clear, like this is the process. So, whatever we model in Revit is what we're going to be building with the, with the panel group, you know? Yeah. It's always hard at the beginning because people are used to doing it a certain way that as you change the way they do it, it, you know, throws them off. But a lot of the problem they were having was just the numbering system. Um, and that's what Zach's working on right now is just making it so they can control the mark numbers better. Uh, because they, you know, they weren't happy with the way the mark numbers were coming out, and so they were trying to make a bunch of ad adaptations, which were kind of, you know, making it hard to do the work. So we'll, um, we're making some improvements on the panel process, but yeah, future jobs, you know, the goal is to 100% take what you guys model and push it through their world. Um, so we just need to get that, you know, well, it'll take a few few jobs to get it clean and get it where we want it, but. Definitely, definitely where we're headed for sure. I was trying to find an inside corner somewhere. So, uh, looking forward, right? Since Katan's mapper is what we looking forward to trying the next one. Uh, is the self model panel 
also using the same effort? Yeah, that's what they're going to find out is what Gabriel has been doing with his team. Um, I don't know who's, I know James is here. Do you know, James, if when you model the panels, are you modeling more than one panel in a family or is it all just individual panels? No, I believe they're individual. Um, yeah, I've had too many jobs with panels on them. But, um... So we can kind of take a look at what, what we're seeing there. And Jessica, the ones you, you looked at in Lawson, they were individual, right? Well, on Lawson, they, they only modeled the parapet, which would only ever be individual anyways. Right. And then I just did all the work by myself for the canopy, which could have been modeled as one, but because I knew that was what we wanted to split them up, I made sure to split them up. Okay. And we didn't uh, get the canopy okay. from sales? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I didn't get the canopy from sales. Okay. And, well, that was something that also uh, may have just been a miscommunication because on phase one, we didn't do the canopy in-house. It was a buyout. Um, but on phase two, for some reason, we decided to do it in-house. So, and that might be why sales didn't um, model it. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, that's, this is one of those ones that's still early on in its process. So there's going to be a few things. But yeah, the goal would be to have the sales group model it the way you guys need it. And then you guys can, you know, update it to what it needs to be based on any changes in the architecturals. And then that's the data that, you know, the panel group would start with and kind of work through. So you might have answered this already, Steve. Um, I was too focused on finding an inside corner panel here. Um, but did you say that these inside corner panels uh, need to be modeled kind of the same method as what we're doing with all the other panels on the project? I mean, to get them to go through the method that we built, yes, they would need to be. Okay. Um, I, I have a family for the inside corners I can share with everybody, but it does have the outside corner, the outside panel and the inside panel in the same family, um, which I've talked to um, Zach about that. It, I mean, we kind of make it a lot harder to accurately place that family if we wanted to um, separate them. So I don't really know if the, I probably need to get back with him on the best way to make that family before I share it with everybody. Are they both field use, the outside and the inside? Um, inside panel is field use. I think usually the um, outside panel is shop use because I think they apply it to the jam and the shop, but I'm not positive. I'd have to look at the detail again. Okay. If the, so if the outside one were shop use, you could just paint the whole thing and it would not be taken off because we're just talking about Sherwin's team, not Saul and those guys. So okay. shop use panels won't go through the same process. So, you know, you could, you could use that same family if you didn't just paint the whole thing so it doesn't get taken off you. So that might be the way to do it. I'll, I'll just check with Zach and then I can have him put it on the server. Okay. Um, and I think that's what, um, or I, um, and for this project, I helped Celine to paint these inside panels. So they, they should show up when they do um, take off. Well, actually, I don't remember Celine, you said you, you checked with Sherwin on these panels um, because they had were missing some data and they weren't showing off and up and then take off browser. Do you remember what the end result was? They are fine with it. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah. And thanks for help. Yeah. Cool. What other questions do you guys have? <laughs> And one, one more thing about the, the panels. Um, so moving forward, is one of the goals going to be um, not to have multiple families as in child families into, built into one family, like to try to simplify them? Yes. Okay. 
it's not necessarily a matter of simplification so much as the mark numbers when it gets to take off stage. Yeah, we yeah because that's one of the, the problems because since of course revisions come and go and we had to do many on Matilda, there are some families that were that had child families and it was a, like a very long process just trying to go back, edit the child family, then go back to the parent family and then reload. So, you know, that's kind of like a lot of a time just trying to revise Oh, the so you're talking about for the adaptive panels families. I think, I think she had done it on the other families too. They were all nested. They were all children when she started. So that's the thing that Catan had experimented with and said they don't really need to be. But I think that, yeah, the okay. goal is not to have them as children at all. So you're not having to go through two layers to get to what you need to do. Cool. Okay. And Joe was going through the, uh, the panel library, removing all the children as well. Other questions? Good questions, keep them coming. Um, so, oh. Go ahead. So, going forward, since we're not working with Advencer, um, is Esley's team going to make all the details or are the drafters going to start jumping in and start making the details once the families are made? So this is what I want to do. I'm, this is what we're experimenting with right now. So we have a couple of goals that tie into this and, and the panel thing one is one of them. The changes to the sales model units is one of them. And this one you're talking about is one of them for me. So I've got a profile detail in AutoCAD. Right, and Amber has a process to make the families that that profile detail represents, and that process is something Alan built for her, and it's fairly automated. Um, there's some stuff that she has to do, and again, a lot of it has to do with the glass, honestly. But um, but it builds that family and saves it, and blah blah blah. Right. Then to make the details, because she goes through and does all the profiles first, then to make the details. She comes back and she's basically putting these profiles on, you know, a Revit sheet and then looking at the detail in AutoCAD and then recreating the dimensions and the notes and the blah, blah, blahs and notches and everything in Revit to look like this profile detail, right? Which is probably similar for you guys. You probably, I don't know how you do it, but maybe you draw it out in CAD, maybe you don't, I don't know, right? But what we were doing is we, we met as a group, and I and I kind of challenged Alan. I'm like, look, there must be an easier way to recreate what's on this AutoCAD drawing in Revit. Because you know, you got to put the dimension in, it flips the wrong way, and you got to change some settings and flip it back, and blah blah blah, and whatever, right? So Alan's creating a tool where you can sort of pick the dimensions in AutoCAD, and it automatically makes the dimensions in Revit. You can pick the notes in AutoCAD, and it automatically makes all the notes in Revit. So my, my intention is that the creation of details, if you have an AutoCAD detail, will be almost nothing to do. Like, you, it will be simple, quick, fast, and, and it won't really be something to talk about. Um, so I don't believe that, you know, that the detailing will take that long when we get done. That's just my opinion. Um, you know, obviously, if you're building perimeter conditions and things like that, I would hope you can copy a lot of that out of the architectural drawing at this point. You know what I mean? It's like, it's right there in Revit. Like we should be able to take it and use it in AutoCAD. I mean, in Revit for our drawing, but that's kind of where I'm at with the detailing. I, you know, there, that team of two people is not going to be able to keep up with all the details for a set of shop drawings. So I think drafting will be doing more of the detailing you know, that's beyond the profile set. But I'm hoping that anything that's in AutoCAD will be easy for them to give you in Revit. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. 
Yeah, because they, they were spending more time checking checking the stuff that they got back from the vendor than it took to do it, you know. So, but this will make it so everything's, you know, right. And you don't have to worry about the checking piece either. Another good one. Now, Steve, it sounded like you were going to ask a question just before Jessica. I just, this picture made me think of like, you know, we've been messing around with the the wild and, and using a set of, you know, Oculus headsets to move around inside a model. And I'm just curious if anybody else in the group here has an Oculus headset that they would want to play with that software. I do. Okay. So I think James, maybe we can get some people invited to those sessions and, you know, that Gabriel's kind of running that and Maybe we can get some more people looking at that because I think the, uh, you know, we kind of signed up for that thing maybe like in April or May um, and the year will end up over there. We have three licenses. So any three people can be inside the model at the same time. You know, anybody with a headset can jump in. You just, we have three total licenses so you can only have three people in a building, but you can literally meet inside this building and walk around and look at things and talk to each other and, pretty fascinating what you can do. I would like some people to maybe, you know, beyond me and Amy and, and you know, Gabe experience that and kind of play around with like, you know, how that might be useful to you guys in drafting, you know. Love to do a pre-takeoff meeting inside this building, by the way, someday. But. Have you, have you tried it, Jim? No, I don't have an Oculus uh, headset. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's you know, the thing we did in the office was good, but you had a cord, there was no sound. Like, this thing, like, literally, you know, the sound is, you know, in your head, you've got the, the headset on, you can walk around your room, you know, you can't run into a wall because it tells you where the walls are. Like, it's pretty impressive, so... It'd be good for some some people in drafting to kind of experience this and see how they might see us using it. Mm -hmm. Anyone else have an Oculus? Or just Jessica? I have a Vive, not an Oculus. I think the Vive still works. Yeah, I can't remember which ones are compatible, but there there were a few, so it probably doesn't have to be an Oculus. So. But we could, you know, we could pick up another headset too if we wanted to. So. I guess just me. Really, it's my husband. I'm not. <laughs> I'm not the techie in the household, <laughs> but I can use it. Other questions. Can you dimension in the Oculus? Can you dimension? Yes. You can you can take notes, you can dimension, you can add geometry, you can move furniture. You can, I mean it's it's pretty impressive what you can do inside there. So there's a lot of options. You can write on the wall. It's it's pretty, you know. You can graffiti your building. Yeah. You can add, you know, you can put a chair and a table in this room and then kind of move them around and sit in them, sit by the fire, have a conversation, you know. You can add video and see the video inside your headset inside the room. It's, it's pretty crazy. Other questions? I mean, we've managed to go at least 46 minutes, which was a lot longer than I was anticipating which is great yeah I know um, you have oh jessica yes okay. Go ahead oh, again. i was Our just community. wondering if we um have uh, any like updates on the next gen w75 system yeah so we've 
We've almost completed the design. We, we got a little bit of feedback from the takeoff team that might change the vertical slightly. So we were adapting to that, um, but it's pretty close to done. The NFRC testing didn't come out quite the way I imagined it. Um, it wasn't really a big significant difference using the fiberglass tongue than it was using an aluminum with a, with a, you know, a thermal break. So, but we met with those guys a little bit and we're going to do a few more experiments using like a, a fiberglass pressure plate also. Um, so we've got a couple of things we're working on to try to look at that a little more, but it's pretty much, you know, we're going to be ordering dyes probably in the next few weeks. So, and then we just decided today, you know, we, we need to have a, a new prefix for it. So all the part numbers get reset. So it doesn't get confusing since we're re changing the verticals and we're changing the horizontals, we might as well, you know, so it will probably be instead of the W75, it'll be an N75 system. Uh, but that's, it's coming on. I mean, we're pretty much done with the design piece. We just have to kind of get the mock-ups together and do the testing and then we should be ready to launch. So. So are any parts from the old W75 wall going to be able to be used at all, or is it all new parts? Well, the verticals were going to be exactly the same. And now with this change to solve one of the problems that the takeoff group has, um, we're probably going to cut new dies on the verticals too. So I think most, almost all the parts will be new because we're not, you know, all the horizontal parts were new already because we're doing a body, a tongue, and a pressure plate and a face cap. So we don't have to notch and all that stuff. Everything can be straight cut. And then, um, but the verticals were, they're the same design we were using, but we may be modifying that now as we're playing around with the NFRC stuff and changing this thing for the takeoff group. So it's mostly new parts. I have a question. Uh, just, uh, I remember this is a uh, previous E, so we have in past jobs, the gas by error was carrying from the profile set. So it was like, um, so it's like a coming to 128 or 130 second like that. So I remember we have a meeting together with Steve, with a bunch of people together to look at the issue with SV2. And we find out there's a way to avoid that happen. I just want to know how is that uh, coming along right now? I just want the result of it. Yeah, so at this point, as this group is changing all the dimensions they get from jumpstart to four decimal places and double checking all of the information they're getting to four decimal places because they need to make sure that it's right. Because um, mm -hmm. they used that AutoCAD data to build the glass bite, and that's where that error was coming in. They're also making sure that the dimensions actually go to something, because a lot of times you'll look at a dimension on a profile set, and the witness line isn't really attached to geometry. It's just out of space. And so I think we've had really good luck with that. And then they are actually, you know, they have an actual physical model that they use once they make the families you know, to put the families in and then put the glass in and then double check things. So I think we've had much better results, a lot less of those kind of odd errors since we added those checking steps, you know, between the Jumpstart team and Esley's team. So Amber has a, a new set of checking steps and it seems like that's, you know, we still get an occasional thing that comes through, but a lot of times it's something old that, you know, is being used for the first time in a few years or something, you know? So, cause I think we had that on, was it on Matilda where we had the little bit of oddness and then it shifted the glass bites? Mm -hmm. It and happened then, uh, after Matilda too. I heard it from the other chapters when we have um, the Hado. I heard it still happen on the next job. I, I forget which job, but I heard that happen on the next job. And I'm not sure how how the other drafters right now is the only one still seeing that occur on their own job. I'm not sure. So I hope, yeah. Yeah, it definitely still comes up. Um, 
And then we did build a tool because you had the other problem with the parts flipping when you got a new family. So we did build a tool to help alleviate that problem too. But you know, a number of these things go away with the modeling method that Gabe's going to be introducing through the sales team also, because we won't be doing that you know, more elaborate glass process like that. So I think in the short term, we have a better checking process. Um, and again, that checking process is only occurring on the new families that are being made. So if you get a family that was made before that checking process, you could still get that error. Right. And, then, um, and then I think as Gabe introduces the new process for how we're going to be doing the units in the glass, it, it will make that a lot simpler because it, the glass pipe is just a parameter on the unit. You know, it's not it's not something super secret in the background like it is today. So, so is the GG two point or three point still uh, applicable for the new method? It it will have to be changed and simplified a lot. Uh, okay. Yeah, the right now you know we're doing a curtain wall and then we're putting curtain panels into a curtain wall. And so the GG 3.0 is storing all the gaskets and setting blocks and glass pipes and all this stuff for every single, you know, million in the, in the company. And then when you run it, it, it just analyzes all of those, you know, generic curtain panels and looks at what's in the perimeter and figures out how to make the glass for it, right? But again, with the, the process we're going to, the the information is stored right in the unit. So one problem people have is when they run GG 3.0, they're gathering data off the server, which makes it super slow. Um, but in this new process, the, the glass bites will actually be held right inside the units themselves. So the process will be much faster um, and a lot simpler to solve if you have a problem, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But again, that's probably, few months away. And, and Steve, since you mentioned about um, like the mullions and the new updates, will we, we then have issues when we have revisions on an old project? Because I know that I encounter a lot of issues with the flipping, um, especially because it was mostly just revisions. So I had families from, I had the older families. I know this happened for 1180 and also El Camino because I recently had to do some changes and that was something I did for, um, even before the pandemic, I think when I started those and that's where I started getting issues and then everything like notes and part numbers inside the Revit model. Yeah, this is, this is one of the difficulties, right? Is when you change, when you change your detailing styles, you know, that's one problem and then like you said, there, there is an inherent problem when people change the orientation of the parts on the server. So we built a tool to analyze the stuff you're going to bring into your model. Um, and, and I don't know, I mean, we'd have to sort of check and see with Gabe and Alan, like, you know, because my intent was it was sort of more gonna happen on the Esli end. You know, if you request a new family, they would analyze it to make sure it's not going to impact your model. But the way this would work is that instead of just inserting something in your model and finding out it changed everything on you, this thing would analyze what you're going to insert. It would analyze what it's going to replace and it would tell you if there's any conflict. Like, oh, the orientation is different. You know, which one do you want to use? You know what I mean? And it would, you know, ignore the old one or something, right? So, and, and that tool should be live. I just don't know, I haven't followed up on it lately, like where they're at in terms of, because originally it was mostly going to be Amber and Esley double checking things before they gave them to you. But, you know, I'm not sure, you know, because it would still apply for you too. If you have to bring something into your model and you want to make sure it's not going to, you know, cause a problem, we have, we have a way to look at the two things and tell you before you bring it in, so. But James, do you know where that tool is at at this point? No, I don't. <laughs> just keep, just keep basking and everybody's like, oh yeah, it's good. You know, it's like, so. I think Hiriko's been um, working on it a lot with Alan. 
Okay. Well, she's not here, so we can't ask her about it. Yeah, but there is, but but we should get that. You know, I, I would have thought it'd be in the you know the beta ribbon at this point. You know, the idea was just before you bring something into your model, you'd use this tool to bring it in, and it would tell you if there's any conflicts before you brought it in. So you're not, you know, parts aren't flipping on you and all that kind of stuff too. Yeah, it is in beta, but I think right now, really the person who's using it the most is Eureka to update the library details. So, and maybe it's just, maybe we just need to push it um, to the tab for everybody. Yeah, that might be a good idea because again, even, even in its beta state, it would be helpful to know before you bring something in, if it has a problem. And the nice part is it, it can solve the problem for you. You know, it can say, oh, well, let, use this orientation and it would not jack up your model, you know. Did you learn anything uh, really interesting at AU? You know, I mean, I think the, the couple of key takeaways for me, um, I like the, I like the new idea of plan grid in the job on the job sites um, and for the PMs. And it's kind of built into a lot of the BIM 360 stuff now. So I think that might be a good way for us to be, you know, reviewing our instead of making PDFs, you know, going electronically to everybody, you know, rather than a PDF file. Um, so that was interesting because they bought them a while ago and they're just starting to bring them into the main fold of, of how you do things, right? And that could affect markups and all sorts of things. Um, and then just, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of industrialized construction going on where people are building, you know, modular parts of buildings and then assembling them on job sites. And, you know, you saw a lot more of that this year. Um, we're working with a company right now that we met last year at AU um, to kind of look at, you know, helping them build skins like that where we, you know, build the skins in our factory, ship them to their factory, they put them in the ends and they put them in the building. So I think that's a big deal that's coming on. Um, I know Gabe got some really good tips and tricks kind of things that solve some problems that people had come to him with. So I think he'll be a good one to maybe do a little, uh, you know, Autodesk overview. But for me, those were kind of the key things, like where things are headed. You know, I like the idea of sort of moving our J drive into teams, you know, and then there's a way to connect those files, you know, out to the, you know, the, the job sites and, and to the PMs and stuff like that without, and having them all be sort of in the cloud instead of stuck in the server. Um, so there's, there's some interesting things like that. We're going to meet with Autodesk in a couple of weeks and kind of go through some of those workflows and see if that might be something we could sort of adapt to. So but maybe not have to make PDFs anymore. Yeah, that would be nice. Solve all, all our um, refuses to staple issue and upside down views issue. I know. But I'm, you know, I, I know Bluebeam was, you know, a big deal for us to get in place and everything, but I just, it's so many little things that drive me nuts. So. You know, but it's it's hard to find a good solution there. And I don't know, you know, dumbing our drawings down to a PDF just makes no sense anyway, right? So I think something like plan grid, you know, might be a good alternate method that doesn't require conversion, right? Yeah. All right. Well, we managed to uh, reach the four o'clock hour. So uh, thank you all for your questions and uh, Thanks, Steve, for answering most of those questions. <laughs> so it was a good class, brother. <laughs> All right, glad it worked out well. So. Yeah, thank you. That was very good. All right. See you guys. See you guys. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Bye. Bye guys. Bye, Bye guys. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye.